So I know that just because of the things that we talk about here every week, when you say the word liberal, that mm -hmm. a certain amount of my audience is going to go, wait a minute, does he mean classical mm -hmm. liberal or does he mean progressive or leftist or something? You, you I, it's obvious to me you're making that distinction, mm -hmm. but the word liberal has now <clears throat> been so muddied that in yeah. some ways it's, it's not even yeah. worth the progressives who, who uh, shut down the Nickelodeons in the turn of the 20th century, they're the ones who changed the meaning of the word. They, yeah. they seized it sort yeah. of after World War I and said, oh, no, we're liberals. And people are like, what are you talking about? You're not liberals. You <laughs> want the state to control much of the economy and, and much of our lives. And, um, but they, they, they started to use that word, and it stuck. And so once the, once the New Deal happens in the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt becomes another Jesus figure. And he calls himself liberal, and they people call his movement liberal, then it, that was it. That was the moment, the turning point. No, this is all, of course, a repudiation of classical liberalism, which is right. about the individual, you know, having some autonomy, or at least freedom from the state and its power. Do you think that people like us can win that word back? Hmm. That's what I've been thinking about a lot lately. Like, like, I like making this argument for liberalism versus the left. I just don't think it's a, a liberal movement anymore. Okay. And I know that I brought a lot of people to it and have many allies that are doing similar work, you included. Um, but do you think it's possible? Like the word liberal is now so tainted <clears throat> mm -hmm. that in the, in the broader sense, maybe we can't build something around that word. Not to say the ideas can't be used in another way. Yeah, so I'm not sure I want to. So I'm not a classical liberal and I don't love classical liberalism. I like some of it, mm -hmm. but the the Puritan notion of the repressed individual who never talks about sex and only has sex to procreate and who works all the time, that's actually at the center of classical liberalism. So if you read John Locke and you read the Founding Fathers, this is what they say, you know, we must regulate ourselves so that the state doesn't have to. So it's a, it's a cultural Puritanism. Mm -hmm. It's good that they don't want the state regulating us in those ways, so I like that, I like yeah. the Bill of Rights. But they say, for that to happen, for that to be possible, we must constantly police ourselves. So the cop becomes internal. The, mm -hmm. police, the policeman is inside of us. So I don't love that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's interesting, because I've never thought of it in that, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, but to me that was more of just a sign of the times than Versus now, because aren't we mm -hmm. all policing ourselves in, in our own way? I mean, every day you get up and you don't do everything, that every whim that you want to do and every sure. crazy urge that you want to do. So we're all sort of doing that just mm -hmm. by living, right? Oh, yeah, sure. It's not, I mean, uh, it's not a, it wasn't a sign of the times. It, they made this argument. I mean, mm -hmm. Locke and the Founding Fathers, the whole first chapter of my book, Renegade History, is on this. I mean, if you think about it, it's consistent, right? They wanted the people, or at least some of the people, many of the people, to control the country take it away from the king and run it themselves. And they understood this thing that the, that the Leninists understood a century later, which is that, oh, to do that, Jesus, we've got to like learn a bunch of stuff and we've got to stop you know, going to the cockfights and stop smoking <laughs> cigars. No, really, and stop drinking most of all. And because we've got to work to do, we've got to run this country. Yeah. Democracy, I say, is puritanical for that reason. So it's interesting because, uh, as you know, you, so you work with Learn Liberty. They're a classical liberal organization. They sent you to me. I, I just want to make up. No, but I want to make a point of saying that's why it's a beautiful thing that we're yeah. doing with them, because you just said I am not a classical liberal. Yeah. Where, where do you, if, if you had to give yourself a label, I know you don't want to get hung up on that kind of stuff. But I sense a lot of classical liberal stuff from you. I sense some libertarian stuff from you. I sense some utility of the state mm -hmm. from you. Mm -hmm. What the hell is that? I don't know. Let's make up a new word. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I am, I have sort of um, culturally, I guess I'm anarchistic, I suppose. I, I am anti-authoritarian. I'm anti-authority. It doesn't mean I want to demolish authority and remove authority. In fact, I like that there are some people in this world who want to take charge because I don't want to do that work. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't want to do that work. Yeah. It's weird, right, that there are some people who just want to manage everything and like take control and take care of everything. I don't want to determine who picks up your garbage yeah. on Monday morning. I mean, that's fine. I'm glad you want to do that. Mm -hmm. I'd rather play video games or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And so I don't know what that is. I mean, it's, um, that's why I like a lot of libertarianism, you know, obviously, because they want the state out of our lives. But a lot of libertarians are, have this classical idea of the self-regulating individual mm -hmm. there, right at the middle of it. And so I don't like that at all, because they're kind of not fun either. They're, they were actually, a lot of libertarians remind me of the socialists that I grew up with. Hmm. They're very stodgy and very kind of uptight and controlled and not interested in the real world and the pleasures in the real world. Mm -hmm. All the pleasure they get is from reading books. 
which yeah. I understand, but there's more to life than that. Right? Yeah, you know, this past week was, uh, or about a week ago was VidCon, which is where all these the YouTubers get together. I, I didn't go, but a lot of the people that are sort of in my YouTube circles, mm -hmm. most of them are, are younger than me, were there, and it seemed like what I could gather was they were the fun group. That there's these people on the left that are screaming about third wave feminism and all this stuff, and then they're uh, at a YouTube conference. There's not a lot of many people on the traditional right, but that this new group, whatever this thing is, of these sort of half liberal, libertarian mix, whatever, that they're the fun group, and that's what's attracting people. I think that was probably a lot of what was in the middle of Gamergate, which was that there's these kids playing video games who like looking at women with big boobs and My have God. and enjoying it. Right, and that was about it, I think, for most of them, yeah. I would imagine, right? Yeah. They like shooting people, right, yeah. virtually, <laughs> yeah. you know, and watching the heads explode, which you're not allowed to do. By the way, that's another form of repression that the Puritans and the Victorians instituted. We can't fight each other in the streets, that's anarchic and, and disorderly. Mm -hmm. We have to let the state do all the killing for us, right? We get the monopoly on violence, the state does, so you can't do that anymore. So, like, boxing was shunned for a long time. All these things, you know, mm -hmm. and so I think I think video games represent sort of a, a return of the repressed, to use Freud's term, yeah. you know, in that way, because these kids are doing stuff you're not allowed to do through these video games, which is kill and have sex, or at least some kind of sex, right. be sexual in that way, and it's fun. Now we know that it, this didn't cause them to go out and shoot people. We know that it didn't cause them to go out and rape people. We know this from many, many, many studies, right? Yes, every study, yeah, basically. Yeah, every study, okay, yeah. so we just know that. Um, and so they were having fun doing the stuff that you're not allowed to do or even express. You're not even allowed to express those desires in this culture, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you have these people coming in, swooping in and telling them that not only what they're doing, just their thoughts, their feelings are bad, but that it's gonna cause another Sandy Hook mm -hmm. and another mass rape somewhere, and that it's, it's the cause of the subjugation of women. Well, it doesn't make sense to these kids, and I'm, I imagine, and it's like we were just having fun in our mom's basement. Yeah. We, by the way, we have zero institutional power in this country. Right, nothing. <laughs> nothing, and you're telling us suddenly we are the most powerful people in the world. Now, by the way, I'm speaking for them now. <laughs> Why, wh here's what's so amazing to me. It's we like, should have a Gamergat hat for you. Yeah, you know? here's what's so amazing to me. It's like, why are feminists or, or any, why is anyone so concerned about what those people think? Like, that's what is, becomes important in mm -hmm. a lot of feminist discourse is what we think, what mm -hmm. men think. Well, that, all that does is sort of reinscribe the patriarchy, right? What we think, what we do is what's important. What right. men do and think is what's important. Well, how about just say, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, and many feminists, by the way, have done this. There's a, there's a different strain of feminism that I love, mm -hmm. which has been called sex positive feminism or independent feminism, but. Right. So that's sort of more the Christina Hoff Summers. I know she doesn't focus that much mm -hmm. on sex, but, she, but more just like let them do their thing. You know? Maybe, yeah. yeah. So I, I had a guest on my show, uh, her name's Anna Aerosmith. She's a, she was a feminist in, and she hated pornography. She thought it you know, degraded women. And then she was walking down the street in Soho in London, which is the red light district basically yeah. in London, thinking and watching all these shops full of these you know, video, videos uh, with sex all over it. And she was turned on by it. And she thought, oh, wait a minute, I'm turned on by this. <laughs> but I don't like that, so you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make my own porn. And so she started making her own porn. She became the biggest female pornographer in the world. Huh and did it on her own terms, and it's all hardcore. There's nothing, she doesn't hold, any, hold anything back, she just makes it nicer looking, and the men are better looking, et cetera. And that's it, to me, that's feminism. Do it on your own, make your own world, right? Instead of worrying constantly about what I want and what I think. Yeah, how unhealthy do you think just having to talk about politics all the time is? I don't mean <laughs> what we're doing right here, mm -hmm. so I don't mean for the people that have these conversations about ideas and that. But I mean for the average person that all day long now because of social media is harping about every little decision that happens in the government and that I, it strikes me as it's becoming, it's starting to like really rot people's minds or something. Like I would argue that a good government is one that's small enough that you wouldn't have to talk about it all the time. Now there's probably good counter arguments to that. But the idea that people are all day worried about this stuff. <laughs> Seems like a real problem. Well, so when you say people, 
<laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. how many people are we talking about? Again, I think it's right. Like, it's hard to gauge. There's the. I think it's a lot of people talking to each other, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's a pretty small world that we inhabit or mm-hmm. that we observe, right? I think the. I think most. Well, what is it? Twenty five percent of Americans are on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's a quarter. That's a pretty big chunk. But of those, how many just read Twi- Katy Perry's feed, right? I mean. Right. I think that those who do politics... Which can be bar- bizarrely political, though, because of doing stuff with Hillary, so... Okay, yeah. but let's say, you know, what's called political Twitter. Yeah. I don't know, but how many people are there, right? I, I, and how many people there are just, you know, just check in on the Democratic Party's latest, you know, issue, uh, announcements, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's a pretty small world. I'm not too worried about the population in general. Uh, but I do think that the world that you and I have chosen to uh, live in is pretty uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I'd say since the election in particular, it's nearly intolerable. So Mm -hmm. I used to be a Twitter addict. And then since the election, it's actually been really hard. It's not been fun to go on Twitter. It really almost never is fun. It almost always makes me sad or angry. (laughs) And so I I watch it less, you know, and I don't know. I think that may be the next phase we're going to go through, that Twitter will become something else or there'll be alternatives to it. And, you know, it's just people talking. The thing is to just keep going and not, you know, it's hard, but to not let the eggs with the five followers get to you. They get to me, Mm -hmm. but we just have to keep going if we want to do this. Yeah. Um, What about the amount of time that we're spending on this? I think that's really what I meant there. Not Not just the griping, but the amount of time people are worried about these things. Like the broader people. I yeah, think. I mean, well, the, the thing that I don't like is there's, is the policing that goes on. It's a constant policing, right? You said this, and there, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't think this. You shouldn't feel this. You need to check yourself. You need to watch yourself. It's all, it's a totalitarian language, mm-hmm. um, which again, by the way, comes out of the Frankfurt School. Um, it does, which, you know, their argument was that language is this tool of the oppressor against the oppressed, and so we need to, we need to, um, recapture the language and make it our own to bring about revolution. That was the Frankfurt School. Um, it's, it's a totalitarian impulse. It's a t- totalitarian politics. It's, it's no fun to be around. And I think that's the thing. People are just, they're repudiating it sort of tacitly mm-hmm. in that they are, they're watching their video, they're, they're playing video games instead. They're watching television instead. They're not engaging in this discourse. You and I are masochists because yeah. we do it. <laughs> Most people are not masochists in that yeah. way. So that's to me the cause for hope. Yeah, it's so funny because I enjoy 90% of this. There is that 10% of just, you know, when people are maliciously misquoting me or writing things that are blatantly not true. The rest of the interaction, I, I can basically deal with, and I do love the battle of ideas, but believe me, I, I hear you. There's, a, there's mm. like an unspoken thing that we can do here that I can't quite right. quantify in words. So I'm curious, so all this being said, you have an interesting mis, you know, uh, mixed match of politics and, and culture and all that stuff. Is there anyone in politics right now that, that you like, that you go, well, no. this guy kind of gets it? <laughs> no. Yeah. And, and meaning like electoral politics? Yeah, just anyone right now. Or, or oh, who, no. in the, who in the public space in general? Like, is there like a couple, is there anyone? In electoral politics, there's no one. Yeah. I mean, I thought, I thought Trump was interesting in yeah. these ways. He was at least raising these questions for the first time. I mean, I can't stand most of what he's for in terms of policy, but... He was raising these questions for the first time, so I got to talk about them, and that was great. Thank mm-hmm. you for the opportunity. Now leave office, and, <laughs> don't, and or, or just please don't do anything when yeah. you're in office. This is the best thing. But no, in electoral politics, there's no one because they are part of the machine, or at least they want to be part of the machine. So being part of the machine means making yourself a cog, right? Uninteresting in my, you know, uninter- uninteresting to me. Um, there are very few cultural radicals left. There are a few sort of sex radicals. There's like three. You know, mm-hmm. I find them interesting. You know, people who say, yeah, we should talk about sex. We should be able to express our desires openly. Uh, it's better. Sex is a good thing. Sex is not a bad. Uh, they almost don't exist. The 60s had that. The new left and the counterculture had some people there who were quite interesting in that way. Mm-hmm. But they're gone, and it's very sad. Yeah, it's interesting. There's this writer, I forget what he writes for even, but I don't know if you saw this thing where he took a screen capture of his screen, and one of his tabs had hentai porn on it, which I guess is, it's like octopus mm-hmm. porners. I don't know, some like, some cartoon porn. But he's a lefty, mm-hmm. so all these people on this alt-right, you know, these, we, anything goes over here, they were all attacking him. And I was like, mm. do you guys not see the irony in mm. what you're doing here? Like, 
It wasn't illegal what he was doing. It was some odd thing, you know? Well, I mean... But I thought you guys are the free being, you know, all righties. I mean, a lot of the left, I would imagine, is, would attack him too. I mean, they have in the past, right? Because yeah. that's, you know, that's the objectification of women, so we can't have that. Right. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not fun. Um, but, so in terms of... Yeah, no, I guess, I, I guess it's sort of my mission to kind of bring back that kind of, and it is left wing. Here's, mm -hmm. here's part of my politics too. It's like a, that sort of left cultural radicalism mm -hmm. back into political discourse, which it just doesn't exist really. So when you say left cultural rad mm -hmm. radicalism, you, mean, you actually do mean freedom mm -hmm. in, in that context. It doesn't sound like something that's of the modern left now, but that's what you're talking about. You're talking about real great art. You're talking about great comedy, all of those things, yeah. right? I'm talking about Lenny Bruce yeah. and Richard Pryor. Right. You talk about stand-up comics. Yeah. Those are my heroes. Those yeah. are my original heroes. Richard Pryor is my original hero because he did that. He just said, he said what you're not supposed to say. He said what you're not supposed to say. That's what great comedy is. That's yeah. what makes us laugh. And that's what makes them so brilliant, you know? And yeah, I don't know if that's lost, but it's certainly being challenged. Oh, it's being, it's just being squeezed. Lenny I mean, Bruce yeah. went to prison yeah. for that, okay? And so do we want to return to that? Do we want to put comedians in jail for saying things you're not supposed to say? Not doing things you're not supposed to do, mm -hmm. saying things you're not supposed to think, giving voice to the taboo, yeah. giving voice to the forbidden. That's what they do. Shouldn't we have that? Imagine what would be happening if George Carlin, who would be 80 years old right now, was still trying to go to college campuses. They'd be screaming about this old white man who's saying all of these things. This is a massive problem. That's yeah. why, by the way, I was so uh, dis dispirited, I guess, by Bill Maher's apology, mm -hmm. because everyone knows he's not racist. So I'm not saying that I'm gonna sit here and wanna use that word if it bothers people. Of course, speech has consequences, I understand that. But the apology struck me as, man, a comedian who's been the hero of the left has to now bow to them. Th this strikes me as a major problem. Okay, are you ready to get into more trouble, Dave? Let's go. Okay, so nigger is arguably the most important word in American history. If we don't use that word, we're not serious about understanding American history. We're not serious about understanding that this culture. You can be an anti-racist or a racist or anything, but if you don't talk about that word and use that word the way it's been used in history, not to hurt people, not as an epithet, but to simply refer to it, right? If we can't do that, we're not grown-ups here. We're not being serious about ideas, about history, about our culture, about America. We can't understand it. And that's really what it is. It's avoiding these ideas rather than hitting them head on. People talk about slavery as if they know anything. They don't know anything about slavery. They just know that it was wrong and there was whippings all day long and it was nothing but rape and torture. Having never read a thing about the history of slavery, it's the same thing, right? It's, it's when you moralize, right, about ideas, that is anti-intellectual. That is saying, oh, this thing is outside the realm of discourse. This is outside the realm of inquiry. It's anti-intellectual and it's lazy. And I would say it leads to things that are worse. It leads to things like Donald Trump yeah. because you are repressing again these ideas and there are people who just won't be repressed and they're gonna come back and they're gonna say, yeah, you're playing identity politics. You're saying, there's blackness and whiteness and you're black and I'm white. Well, okay, fine. Now I'm going to say I'm about whiteness and being white. So that's the problem there. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very bad thing to avoid. We have to use these words. Yeah, it's so interesting because I've heard people make that argument. I saw my friend Michael Shermer make that argument about that you're just creating mm -hmm. an identity politics of white people. And I saw mm -hmm. him get into a fight with, with some leftist professor on Twitter. And I, by the way, I, I offered her an opportunity mm -hmm. to come here and defend her ideas. She declined. Um, but I, I so obviously see that, but it also leads to all sorts of other cultural rot because by taking the word out of Huck Finn, mm -hmm. well now you, well that was a book that's, it's not only stood the test of time, but now you're altering the original meaning. Not to mention that Huck Finn was anti-racist. The uh, book, well, yeah. Which as Bill Maher has been anti-racist. But, but the point needs to be made that if it were racist, we still have to use the word, right? Not as an epithet, again, not the way the racists used the word, but we have to be able to talk about the racism, we're not, here's the, here's the terrible irony, is yeah. that by not being allowed to use that word, we are not allowed to talk about racism. We're not allowed to study it, think about it, take it seriously, right? 
You, it's like in Germany, you're not allowed to basically talk about Nazism unless you just sort of moralize it really quickly. Wouldn't mm -hmm. you rather, as a Jew or an anti-Nazi or any, wouldn't you rather uh, study it really hard, really closely, mm -hmm. if you don't want to return to that? Yeah. Right? Well, it's why I mean, as a free speech guy, it's why I'm completely against yeah. the laws that uh, you know criminalize Holocaust denial because they're they're not going to stop denying it. They're just going to go into their secret little places, and I'd rather have all this. There stuff are more the real open. Nazis in Germany than in, than in the United States, where we are allowed to talk about hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. But okay, so you just so you said the word. Now I know a certain amount of people are going to oh. be angry at uh -oh. me because yeah. I have not said the word. Uh -huh. Uh, while sitting here with you right this second, you know that there's a certain cost there. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And it just has, you've just sort of shifted past that. Well, you've, if they, you've, you've hit your, you, you've made your sort of philosophical point, and now it's just. Yeah, and so just, I would just say, just listen to what I say after the word, because I very clearly put forward why we should use that word, and I'm pretty sure what I said was anti racist. Yes. Anti-racist, that anti-racism requires using the word nigger. And that's why all this has been flipped. So then at Evergreen State, to bring this back to 40 minutes ago, at Evergreen State, you have a professor, Brett Weinstein, who was being anti-racist. Mm -hmm. And now he is smeared a racist. So I guess that's what it is. When you don't deal with the truth honestly, you end up having to destroy anyone who even gets close to it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Evergreen is um, <laughs> not a good look, I would say. <laughs> uh, you know, it's. I don't know if you want to go into this too much, but you know, a lot of there's a lot that's not said about what what causes this craziness on campuses, which is that you know there's a monopoly that no one talks about. No one's even aware of this. In fact, I wasn't even aware of it until recently. The the Department of Education and the federal government authorizes accreditation agencies. Accreditation agencies accredit colleges and universities, and they have all these rules. It's not, you can't just become a college. You right. have to have all these things in place for them to accredit you. Without accreditation, the world doesn't take you seriously. Employers don't take you seriously, right? The credentialing is crucial to this, okay? It's the federal government at the head of this whole thing, of this monopoly that they have, right? Then on top of that, there's another monopoly within it, which is tenure, the tenure system, mm -hmm. right? So after seven years, if you're lucky and you're good and you follow the rules and you say the right things, mm -hmm. you get tenure and you're there forever. Now, who do you think you're gonna hire once you have tenure? Someone who is, who's contrary to your ideas or someone who might agree with you? Someone who makes you look good or someone who challenges you? Hence, we have this uniformity of opinion in academia, which is supported, defended, bolstered by this federal government state enforced monopoly. No one knows this. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on here. Third thing, last thing, you add to this, this system of affirmative action, okay, which brings people onto campus who, according to the rules of affirmative action, have less training in academic work than other kids. So when they get there, of course, it's going to be more difficult for them to do the academic work. Also, it has been stated, the purpose of diversity and affirmative action is to have these people represent their race, right? And so imagine how crazy that would make you feel in a <laughs> classroom when you're like one black kid or one whatever kid or two black kids out of 30 and everybody knows why you're there. Mm -hmm and you're supposed to represent your race and people are wondering, assuming that you don't have the credentials that they do, that would make me crazy too. And so I, m almost everything that's been said in the race discourse on campuses over the last three years has been, to me, fraudulent or hysterical and much of it has been totalitarian, by the way. But I think there is something at the bottom of it that's legitimate. There's a legitimate grievance that African American students have on colleges that's not addressed. The, the tools they have to talk about this are only Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and Malcolm X and you know, Bull Connor and oppression and slavery. So that's the way, that's, that's the way they talk about it. And that's, a, that's unfortunate and that's the fault of their professors. We need to give them language to be able to talk about what's really going on, which is not good. It's not fun for them. Yeah. It's hard, I absolutely get that it could feel oppressive. Really, that word is the word I would use if I were them. 
Um, but it's not the oppression they're talking about. There is no physical threat to them. There never has been. Right. There, but there, so that, yeah. It's that, this no, that's so of, interesting yeah. because this, I, I referenced uh, my interview with Jason Whitlock earlier, but he, he said something to that effect that basically the oppression is different now. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to then change tactics. You can't be doing, fighting the way that say a, a Jesse Jackson or a uh, Al Sharpton is using the, the language of the old thing when there's a whole different system in play right, right now where you could get more natural allies. Yeah, and I'm only talking about academia. Yeah. Okay, I'm not talking about being a 19 year old in Ferguson, Missouri. That's sure. a different ball game entirely. I'm talking about academia. I know that world very well. Those are the rules of the world. And that's what happens to these black kids. They're plucked out of these neighborhoods, put in these classrooms and said, oh, go ahead, represent your race. We're gonna pay you to do that. Well, that's gonna make you crazy. So that's a different, it's what I call liberal uh, or racial liberalism. It's a, this idea of the, the representative race and the idea that we will give them the chance to prove themselves that they can be just like us. Mm -hmm. So there's an assimilationist impulse in there too, or an assimilationist expectation. We're gonna show the world that these black people can be just like us, which by the way, is kind of white supremacist in a way, right? Because they're saying, well, our world of course is the best one. Harvard of course is the best place to be. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly elitist and superior and probably white supremacist because Harvard of course is historically a very white institution. Yeah. So just let people do what they wanna do. We don't have to expect them to go to Harvard. All right, well, I suspect we're gonna do this again. <laughs> But I want to ask you one final thing, and I think you, it's sort of been a through line to what you're talking about. I sense sort of like an alternate, so there's sort of a world weariness to you, and then also like a total sense of opportunity. Do you think these things are in like 50-50 with you? Because I, I have a lot of that too. I, I am definitely world, we I worry about the state of the world, the, what is going to happen to the Western world and society and all these trends that I talk about that I think are so dangerous. And yet I could never do this if I didn't have optimism and care about the ideas. Mm -hmm. So I sense that constantly in battle. How? Where are your percentages? Where do you um, get all that to get out of bed and do what you do? So uh, people are wealthier than ever before. There is less poverty in the world than ever before. Um, and so I'm very optimistic about that going forward. I constantly worry about war. I do. I mean, you know, World War II was not that long ago. Vietnam wasn't that long ago. Millions of people died in that war. Mm -hmm. That could happen literally at any minute, you know, thinking about the Middle East and these new coalitions that are forming right now. We have the Saudi, the Sunni side with the Saudis and the US and Israel against the Shia side with Iran and Syria and Russia. Mm -hmm. And if Turkey makes its decision to go with the, with the Shia, which it very well might because yeah. of the Kurds, yep. then look what we have there. We have two huge military alliances potentially fighting each other. That's terrifying to me. So I'm always worried about war. I always will be so long as there are militaries and there probably will be. But so I'm split, I don't know what to say. You know what, I'm okay with ending a show on I don't know All what right. to say. That's the difference between this show and most other shows, as long as you're okay ending that way. Very okay. All right, very good. Well, for more on Thaddeus, check him out on the Twitter, although he's not on the Twitter that much, but he'll, he'll jump on for you. It's at Thaddeus Russell, and thanks for watching. We'll do it again next week. <laughs>